Good morning. It is good to see you as we gather for worship on this last Sunday of July. Uh, as we gather today, I did want to uh, invite you uh, to take in a deep breath. We're here. It's the middle of the summer. It's hot. But nonetheless, as we've gathered together today, I pray that truly you, you sense the Spirit's presence as we gather. And uh, this space was filled with excitement and singing and dancing this week from Vacation Bible School. And I just want to start out by saying a word of absolute thanks to all who helped work behind the scenes to make that happen. It was a real joy um, to have kids fill the space again with us. Um, and to experience the joy of song and story. Um, and the dedicated volunteers of Vacation Bible School this year, I, th I think truly not only were able to make connections, but because the group was smaller, were able to make more meaningful connections. Um, I, Margaret Ann and I talked about this, that this week at different points, because I spent most of the week working the audio and visual booth. Um, the benefit of knowing how the technology works, you're available four nights of the week. Um, but, but seeing, I got to watch the kids kind of grow throughout the week. And one kid said, why aren't we doing it five days? And I said, did you see the energy level on Thursday of the group? That's why. Because um, it was like this. like okay. It was a real struggle. Um, and I said, you wouldn't make it a fifth night, I promise. And I don't know that the adults who love you would either. Um, but nonetheless, I am grateful this morning for the generosity of time and energy even if you weren't able to be one of those volunteers that was here with us throughout the week, thank you for praying with us. Uh, thank you for cheering it on, for creating a safe space. One parent, I'll, I'll let this be our kind of shift into worship. One parent, I said, what, helped, what brought you to VBS this year? And they said, I've been bringing my kids for years. This is where we come for Vacation Bible School. And my youngest kids are now of the age where they get to come, whereas their older siblings are finishing high school. And so we've been that safe place for their family to experience Vacation Bible School for years. And of course, we just said, well, we'd love any time that we can be a part of this community of faith, a connection for your family, we'd love to continue that journey. So I'm grateful for the trust that's been placed in us to keep telling those stories. So today, we're going to continue that journey here in worship, where we're telling some of the stories that maybe are a little more overlooked of the women throughout faith. We started that last week. Today we continue it. We will for the next four weeks beyond today. Um, and so thank you for being with us on this journey as we meet some of these amazing women who truly kept the faith alive for the Israelites. And uh, we'll get a chance to see some of that today as we gather. Uh, each Sunday, whether you're joining us here in person or at home or on the road, we have some joining us from out west as well in worship, um, know that we invite you to pause, um, to light a candle, and to invite God's presence among us as we gather in worship. I know that we are connected beyond this very sanctuary space because one of our saints that we, that we said goodbye to most recently, E.D. Thompson, every Sunday with his son, would light a candle at the dining room table and would be reminded that God is present with them as they gathered with us here in worship. And so for the ways that worship is extended today, and the light goes from the Christ candle to the table, may we gather in worship now.
Good morning. Will you please join me in the call to worship? We follow in faith, not fear. The infant Moses was born into a time of fear. Fear for the Israelites' lives, their children, and fear of the leaders of Egypt. We, we follow in faith, faith not, not fear. <clears throat> fear does not mean cowering in terror before an angry God, but having a healthy sense of respect for God's ways. We are called to be in, in the business of life, not death. We follow in faith, not fear. We are never alone. Following God's ways, we can work together to overcome any obstacle. Mr. Rogers always reminded us to look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. We, we follow, follow in faith, faith not, not fear. I invite you to rise and body our spirit as we sing together. Give to the winds thy fears. That's okay. Just they got it. <laughs> I invite you to hear the scripture as it comes to us from the book of Exodus, beginning in chapter 1, and we'll read through the first part of chapter 2. Hear the context for our story today of the women who kept Moses alive. Chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom, and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread. So much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shipra and Pua. When you are helping the, e the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the, king, the Egypt king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives together to called the two midwives and said to them, Why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, Because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They are much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son, 
She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds at the river brink. The boy's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river while her women's servants walked along beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds, and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child. The boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, would you like for me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. After the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I pulled him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, friends. We had vacation Bible school last week. Y'all remember seeing Sparky, I know. It was so much fun. We did so many activities and worshiped and sang and played games and made crafts and, oh, it was just great. I saw lots of you all there and, and I saw lots of brothers and sisters. I love watching to see how you kind of react to each other and how you live together while you're out. Now, it was fun because sometimes I saw you and you came and went and you acted like you didn't know your brother or sister at all. Sometimes you came and you were holding hands and you guided your sibling to their spot. Some of you asked me during the week, how is my brother or my sister doing in their class? Because you weren't in the same class. Or at the end of vacation Bible school, how you wanted to make sure you found your sibling so you could leave safely together. That was so much fun. This week, we've heard the story of Miriam. Now, one of the big stories we hear about in the Bible is about Moses and all of the things that he did as he followed God's path to lead the Israelites to the promised land. We start by hearing about Moses when he is a small infant. His mother wants to save his life, and so she puts him in a basket in the Nile, hoping that someone will find him and save him. But Miriam, his older sister, didn't think that was enough because she saw Pharaoh's daughter come to the riverside. And Miriam, that little girl, walked up to the Pharaoh's daughter, the ruler's daughter, and said, Hey, can you help this little boy? I, I can help find someone to take care of him for you if you'll become his protector. And it happened. Miriam helped save Moses' life. Miriam was there as the Red Seas parted and Moses led the Israelites across the Red Sea on the other side. She got her tambourine out and she sang songs of praises and taught them all to the Israelites. She was there as Moses made decisions and he listened to God. She was there in the good times and the hard times. She was there supporting him because she loved her brother, mm, but she loved God. And so she worked hard to work with Moses to help lead the Israelites into God's paths, into God's way. Did it always go well? No. After all, they were brother and sister, and you know how brothers and sisters still squabble. But they tried so hard. Miriam recognized that she could do amazing things by following God, by supporting her brother, by having those hard conversations she needed to have with him every so often, as sisters and brothers do, by being a communicator and helping others to know what was happening Miriam was one of those unstoppable women in the Bible. 
that didn't get the big headline. But she should have. Miriam, for us, is a reminder and a witness to what it is to follow God, to take seriously listening and being part of a group of people who want to follow God's way, to recognize who a leader is and what their role is as the group comes together, in this case, to lead the Israelites to safety. I bet there are others even today who are doing the same thing as Miriam did then, who are following God, who are listening and looking for the leaders, stepping up when they need to be a leader, and then standing beside when they need to support someone. Miriam was one of the many unstoppable women that we can learn from. I hope that in the week ahead, you'll look for opportunities to be with your sibling. Maybe it's your best friend. Maybe it's a cousin who you feel so close to and to learn what their skills are, what they're good at, what you're good at, and blend them together so that you are amazing together. Miriam was unstoppable. Let's be unstoppable too. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for Miriam and her witness to how to follow you in good times, hard times. We know we can do anything and be unstoppable in your name. Thank you. Amen. Our hymn of preparation is Trust and Obey. I invite you to go ahead and stand as you are able in body or spirit, and let's sing these two stanzas. I invite you to join me as we gather in a word of prayer this morning. Loving and gracious God, as we gather this day to hear from the scripture, not only read but proclaimed, we thank you for the gift of those unstoppable women who surrounded Moses today as we lift them up and celebrate them. Bless us, O Lord, with the gift of their stories. For Shipra and Pua, for Miriam, for Jochebed, for the Pharaoh's daughter, and for all who join us this day in taking risks for the sake of life. We give thanks and pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. As we gather together today, we shift from Genesis and our story of Eve to a group of women. We often hear about Moses as the leader of the Hebrew people, right? And we teach those stories to our children, right? Let my people go, and Moses led the Israelites uh, out of slavery in Egypt, 
and to the, well to the edge of the promised land and the story is filled with lots of ups and downs and messes but we forget sometimes some of the earliest characters that really made it even possible for Moses to lead the people out because you see Moses was born at a time when fear was high among the leaders, particularly of Pharaoh or the king. The language is kind of interchangeable in our common English Bible. Um, but the leader of Egypt at that time, one of the kind of core things we learn immediately about that leader is there came a time when they remembered Joseph no more. Now Joseph was an, an important character towards the end of Genesis because he helped not only save his own people, but Egypt from starvation during a famine. Because those crazy wild dreams that he had had, it actually led him to help them prepare for a season where they wouldn't have food. And so those who lived through that time were extremely grateful and there was a generosity. But what is interesting about this kind of shared journey is you put a little space and time and we forget those who have carried in the past we, we've fallen victim to that often in our own stories that we tell of our own cultures and of our lands, right? This is a struggle that, that, that the U.S. particularly has. We don't like to always tell the full story of our own journey. And sadly here, we see that happen. They're not continuing to tell the story of how they need one another. They're interdependent, and so quickly fear rises up. And Pharaoh leads the charge in beginning to other the Israelites. And fear takes over to such a degree that he begins his kind of movement of fear-based planning with the midwives. Now the midwives' responsibility was to go and be present with women as they were giving birth to children. And here we meet two of those midwives who are actually named I'd like to lift up that Pharaoh was not, but the midwives are. And so part of that is you get a chance to pause and realize who's writing the story. And so these two midwives, Shipra and Pua, are there and are present. We, we don't fully know, though many scholars lean to them being Hebrew women, whether they were Egyptian or Hebrew. There's something even more coercive, should they be Egyptian, that they would undermine their own ruler but even if they were Hebrews, there's still something about it that their core value is for life. That's their main function. That's why they are there is to bring life, to offer everything they can to the bringing of a child into the world. And so to ask them to deny that in many ways would be to look a nurse in the face and say, I want you to give up your Hippocratic oath. I want you to deny the very character of why you do this work for my agenda. That's essentially what they're being asked to do, is to undermine a core value. But they don't do that. And in fact, uh, the book that I shared with you last week, From Widows to Warriors, um, the, the women's stories of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible written by uh, Dr. Lynn Japinga, she says it this way. She says, whether they were lying or telling the truth, their response, the midwives' response, was an act of creative resistance that kept the babies alive. In the face of such violence, saving lives was more important than always telling the truth. Saving lives was more important in that moment than always telling the truth. And because of that resistance, she goes on, the Israelites continued to multiply, which only multiplied the fear that the Pharaoh felt. And so one of the great ironies of this story is he goes from saying, kill them on the spot, to throw all the baby boys in the river. That, that, that surely will take care of it. And so there's a part of me that always wondered, was Moses truly one of a, one of a few or very few of his own age group? And his story pops out to us because we think, look, he was thrown into the river in this basket and yet he's saved. And we move on and we forget the fact that there were other women who had to choose creative resistance as well. The first, of course, is his mother who chose not to allow him to be killed. Now, her name would not pop up in that early story. It would only come later in Exodus 6 and even later in Numbers, a later book. Um, we, we see her name as Jochebed, um, is one of those. 
Um, and, the, and his father's name potentially is Amram. And I'm probably not pronouncing it fully correctly, and I apologize for that. I don't speak Hebrew regularly. Um, but they had, there was a part, and in Hebrews later, the two of them would be celebrated, Moses' parents. But we really don't know whether Moses' father participated in this resistance. The reality is the mother had to. Right? When you give birth to a child and you choose not to allow it to be killed, you are create, given that that's the king's order, that is very much a creative, that's a resistance. I will not give in. And she chose to nurse that child until she could no longer hide him. And it says she places the child in the basket of reeds, whether or not she stays with it, or if she's looking for somebody to enter the river with the hope, we don't know. That part of the story is left for our imaginations. But this we know is that, that the sister of that child in the basket stays close enough to watch. Now that sister we would come to potentially know as Miriam, uh, who is one of the named siblings of Moses. And Miriam goes to the Pharaoh's daughter who sees this child, and in that moment Pharaoh could have chosen our Pharaoh's daughter could have chosen to follow the line of her father and just flip the basket. We may not want to acknowledge that, that she had a choice before her that she could have said, I'll continue to honor what my father's doing and I'll, have, I'll kill the child. But instead, she pulls the child in and there's a sense of empathy that grows in that moment. And of course, Miriam, being creative, comes to say, would you like me to find one to care for this child? And of course she says yes. And she would bring the child back into her home. Moses would come to live with her there. And so I want you to take a moment to, to reflect on this. The midwives, the mother, the sister, and now the daughter of the very person who gives the command to end this child's life, all are choosing to resist the order. Can you take that in for a moment? All of them are choosing not to obey what has been given by the authorities on high. They're choosing to instead resist, putting their own lives at risk. There's often a phrase that says, if you, look to, if you really want to see the strength of a leader, often look at those who surround them. The reality is, as Moses, in much of his life, is, I hope would be thankful for those women who stood with him, he would never have made it to that place had it not been for them choosing to engage in a creative resistance, is the word she uses. They had to choose life instead of death. I wonder, oftentimes, if we would be invited to choose the same. If we would be among those who would in the face of kind of ruthless oppression, say we're not going to participate in that, we're going to choose a different way. Now the challenge is that when we read this story, it seems so large that we think, what could I do? And we forget that it was small actions. The midwives chose not to honor the command and were creative in the response. The mother chose life over death. The sister chose to stay connected when she could have just turned and grieved with the family. Pharaoh's daughter chose to bring the child in when who knows what kind of fury it would have raised with her father. They made small, intentional actions one after another that called into question the way that things were becoming. And many, in many ways, they are the foundation by which Moses' life was built. Church, I wonder what small actions we need to be engaging in so that those who come after us will know life and life more fully. You've heard us talk from this pulpit and in this congregation about our struggle of walking alongside the immigrant, walking alongside those who are oppressed and pushed out in our society. We've sought to do that as we've journeyed with our neighbors experiencing homelessness, those who have felt excluded because of sexuality, We've sought to try and stay connected, and sometimes we've raised those conversations of sexism and racism to the surface that we talk about it as a community of faith, and it's not always easy work, amen? And it can make us quite uncomfortable. 
And yet, if we're to honor these women, we have to raise those conversations to the level where we begin to do the hard work because the faith continuing on can't ignore that. Moses would eventually lead his people to life when death was the reality. But he couldn't have done it without Miriam and those other women that stood with him. And in fact, Miriam would continue the journey with him. You may not have stayed with her story. It's a kind of complicated one. She would become a leader of Israel, of the Hebrew people. She would be one of the first named prophets as well. So she had great power. She would be a song leader, and so she would help lead in worship. Sadly, though, there were some that would become concerned with her leadership as you go later in the book of Exodus to such a degree that they would seek to undermine that. Um, now, I won't be able to go into all the detail of all those pieces that surround that tension, but I did want to lift up just a couple quick things. Miriam and Aaron, which we would see as one journeying with Moses as a part of that process of leaving Egypt, would raise some questions about Moses and his leadership towards the middle of Exodus, chapter 12, and would particularly raise some concern about his wife, Zipporah. And in the midst of that tension, um, there would be a question that would be raised. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has the Lord not also spoken through us? Now, I want to lift up a tension that I have with the Scripture, particularly after spending the last year reading about women of the Bible. Men, we really fall short when we're the only ones writing the story to fully understand the women in our life's perspective. And I fear that Exodus falls into that trap some. Because Moses is likely part of the, one of the writers we accredit. And so they misunderstand and maybe even misconstrue Miriam's presence. And when she raises those concerns, she would end up with leprosy. And of course, they would look at that as a sign of God's displeasure. But nonetheless, she would continue that strong, feisty presence um, throughout the story. And the reality is we needed, Moses needed that not only to survive in his early days, he would also need that in the wisdom of those around him throughout his years of leadership. Moses did not lead on his own just as we do not. We're not meant to be solo warriors out here making a case for something. We are meant to be together in a community. We're meant to walk alongside one another. And so these women remind us that they had to participate together for the sake of Moses. And so I wonder, in what ways in our current world should we be uniting our voices for the sake of good in our community? I have been heartbroken of late to see the conversation in our neighborhood around the encampment in West Nashville. I know homelessness is a real challenge in our city. And right now, I don't see a collective plan that's really at work at the levels of our government and of the city. The response is pretty dismal from my perspective as a faith leader. I'm seeing amazing, amazing uh, organizations trying to do their best to be present. Open Table put a super late minute call out on Friday that Debbie shared about one of those cleanups near the Jefferson Street Bridge so, because one of the biggest concerns that often comes in those encampments is the lack of hygiene and there's just trash everywhere. Did you realize if you didn't have a trash can, what would happen at your house? Right? This is a most basic thing. I mean, I've seen this even on our own side of town, that if you don't have access to trash service, it'll pile up. Um, that happens. And hygiene becomes a challenge when you have no real access to running water. Right? These are basic necessities that we know, that we need water, and naturally we will have some kind of um, excrement of things of, either of our own body as well as those supplies. When we open food and things like that, there's trash that's created. And so, thankfully, Open Table stepped up to be present on Friday to try and be be there in the midst of that. I don't suppose that I have all the answers, but this I do know, criminalizing homelessness is not an answer. And so I believe the church has to take on a creative resistance, much like these women, to say no. 
that each and every person that we find in one of those camps is a person of God, is a child of someone, and we had better start seeing them as such, or else we will lose our own soul in the midst of it, and we, we so easily disconnect the two. But I've watched on neighborhood conversation boards the language and the ways that we speak, and I think that can't be what we've come to as a people. Have we taken on the way of Pharaoh when we demean and see those that we're afraid of as nothing more than a nuisance? Pharaoh tried to work the Israelites into the ground, into their own graves, out of his own fear. Will we do the same with those in our community who are experiencing homelessness or mental health concerns? Or will we see them as people that God has created. It doesn't mean that their story's perfect, but last I checked, neither is mine. The challenges that some of them face are far beyond what I could even begin to imagine. And I'm grateful for this church's commitment to be a part of that work. We have primarily done that work through Open Table Nashville and Room in the Inn, and most recently through Shower the People. Not because we don't think we couldn't go out and do it, but because they have built relationships in those communities and they know them by name. And so we are there to support and undergird that work of relationships. Whether or not you realize it, Open Table truly is working as much as they can to to end homelessness. It came out of the Methodist Church and the goal is actually to move people into more permanent, secure housing. And so when we support them by collecting supplies, by financially coming behind them, by celebrating the newest small tiny home community there at one of our sister churches, part of our goal is that we are working to make sure that homelessness is experienced less and less. Because we want to see all persons have secure housing, a basic necessity. This is just one example, brothers and sisters, I think, where we can follow in the footsteps of those women who kept Moses alive. And the reason I lift up this issue is I, I fear often that as we look to another winner, that we will lose more of our community to death, to exposure to the elements. Most recently in the flooding, two members of the homeless community in one of the encampments died. They drowned alongside their animals. That could have been avoided. So will we join with those women that kept Moses alive and fighting to keep some of the most vulnerable in our community alive and connected? Will we, like the midwives, choose life instead of death? Will we, in the face of a person that we don't know the name of, have the empathy of a mother and a sister even of a foster mother and Pharaoh's daughter, to see them as one of God's children and to choose life and connection over death and removal. I think our faith is wrapped up in this, brothers and sisters, and I will say it doesn't always leave me with a comfortable, warm feeling. Sometimes it leaves me feeling heartbroken. But maybe, just maybe, the heartbreak that Moses' mother felt and his sister felt in the tension is one that led them to hang on to the faith through one of the most challenging times of their life. And maybe it will be the journey and the bridge by which we need to walk as well. This I know. God was present with each of those women, showing them favor and present in the midst of that work, and God will be present with us, even on the days we miss it and we mess it up. May God give us the grace to choose life over death. Amen. Our response is the final stanza of Trust and Obey. Remain seated as we sing together.
What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. As we gather for prayer, as always, I invite you to breathe in and lift the names of those who you are stirred to pray with, the joys and concerns on your heart, and then exhale as you give them fully to God. Let us begin with a time of silent prayer for those on our prayer concern list. This week has been filled with floods and wildfires in our country and around the world. Will you pray this day silently for those and with those impacted by natural disasters? Jehovah, help us as we open our hearts and lives to your presence within those around us. Enable us to see all those who are working together for good and who put others before self. Guide our every action, word, and deed as we walk together with leaders and helpers. Gentle shepherd, you see us, you know us, you love us. Sometimes we are the infant Moses depending on someone to act on our behalf. Other times we are Miriam and the other women willing to risk ourselves for others. Walk with us as we struggle to find our place in our interactions with colleagues, family, friends, and strangers. Place our feet, hands, and hearts where you want them to be. Spirit, push us into risk-taking lives so that others will have what they need to live fully, a safe home, health care, a fair wage, food to eat. Guide us to step out in faith as we treat everyone with dignity and grace, with love and compassion, seeking justice and reconciliation with all those who have been harmed by others. God in community, holy in one, Hear us as we pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we go about that work of joining with the Spirit and setting persons free, I'm thankful for the ways that you have generously joined us in the work of ministry. Um, I celebrated our partnership with Open Table Nashville, and this, this week as our young people were gathering here in this space and learning about God's grace, 
um, that met them with all of the different characters in the stories this week of Mary and of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, names that I remember from my own hearing of the stories when I was younger, um, and with Jesus and Paul and Silas, one of the things they were collecting throughout the week were diapers to go to uh, some of the kids in our community through the Bellevue Community Food Bank. And so they collected over 1,400 diapers. Um, that's a lot of diapers. And here's the thing. I want to celebrate our kids in the midst of that work. So would you join me in giving thanks to God for their, their work? Now, they intentionally chose, we, we, we worked at the food bank to find out what the greatest need was, and it was larger size diapers. And so we focused our energy on those larger sizes. Kids that are not quite potty trained and that, that are larger kids, they're a lot bigger kids these days, I might add. <laughs> um, and so they, they, they were able to do that. And so I would like for a part of our, our offertory today to give a blessing, not only for the work of their hands, but for those that will receive these. Um, so let's take a second to lift that to God as we prepare our own hearts and minds to give not only of our tithes, but also of our lives, as our kids have led this week doing, and their parents who helped make it happen, right? Because I realized that mom and dad had to go and make a decision at the store or to go with them to make that possible. Um, but I'm thankful for their generosity. So let's pray. Loving and gracious God, as we gather this day and we have a pile of diapers to, on our stage with us, we thank you for the generosity of the kids this week who sought to help meet the need of another family, who when they heard the mission call said yes. So bless the work of their hands and that of their, their family that helped make that possible with them for the sacrifices they might have made this week to say we're going to choose another family to have a resource that they might need. We pray your blessing also upon those families that will receive the gifts of these diapers. I've seen the relief upon the faces of families who are given a, a case or a box or a pack of diapers knowing that that's one expense they don't have to incur this week as they struggle to make the next week's bills. So I'm thankful for the generosity of our community and for the ways that the Bellevue Community Food Bank seeks to be present and meet the needs of, of families in our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, thank you for the ways that you join us in ministry and mission. We do this work together. Uh, as you give today, know that for those gathered in the sanctuary, we're not passing a plate as would be our normal tradition, but it is just outside the sanctuary as you leave today that you can place your attendance card as well as your, your gifts to join us in this work. For those joining at home, we, we tell you each week you can use the app uh, or go online or send a check to the church to our locked mailbox. Each of those ways help us do this work. And so thank you, thank you for being generous and joining us. Because of your consistent, faithful giving, we're able to support and create a space for kids with Vacation Bible School who then are able to work to meet the need of local families in our community. So it's all connected and we're grateful. So with that said, let us now... Uh, think of how we might give of ourselves as we hear of, from our Celebration Bell Ensemble today.
Please join me in prayer. God of grace and glory, we offer these gifts as a testimony of our faith. Use these gifts so that we may see one another as you envision us, faithful followers. As we continue in this time of worship, we seek the sanctuary of your comforting peace. In the name of the resurrecting Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And so now we join in the final stanza of Give to the Winds Thy Fears. Let us sing together. Let us in life in death thy steadfast truth declare and publish with our latest breath thy love and guardian care. If you'll be seated, we have a premiere for you.
What a witness and gift this week uh, from Vacation Bible School. A special word of thanks to Katie Nobles, who worked behind the scenes as our photographer and video uh, editor to make sure that we could join and see a little bit of what happened this week. Um, yes, that was a little, as Nikki called it, an Irish jig that the kids learned to dance this week. So to all the adults who learned right alongside them, you're amazing people in my book. Um, <laughs> So as we've gathered together today and we've seen the witness of, of the children who have not only led in joy, but also learned about service and care and love, may we continue to do that work together. Uh, one of my, a blessing that has often come to me that I'll share with you today, it's often called a Franciscan blessing, was likely written um, by a sister um, not by Francis at all, but it would come to us, uh, it was written likely in the 80s, and I can share more about her at another time, but um, these words she, were written and have been passed on for years and years, and so I offer them to you now. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your hearts. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. May that blessing be with us now as we go forth in the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you stand as you're...